Shalom. Welcome back. We're continuing our study of the Clementine Recognitions, also known as the Nazarene Acts of the Apostles, and we are at the beginning of Book 3. Okay, it says, Meantime, Kepha, rising at the crowing of the cock and wishing to rouse us, found us awake, and the evening light was still burning. And when, according to custom, he has saluted us, and we had all sat down, he thus began, Nothing is more difficult, you brothers, than to reason concerning the truth in the presence of a mixed multitude of people. For that which may not be spoken to all as it is on account of those who hear immorally and treacherously, yet it is not proper to deceive on account of those who desire to hear the truth sincerely. What then will he do who has to address a mixed multitude. Will he conceal what is true? How then will he instruct those who are worthy? But if he set forth pure truth to those who do not desire to obtain salvation, he does injury to him by whom he has been sent, and from whom he has received commandment uh, not to throw the pearls of his words before swine and dogs, who, striving against them um, with arguments and sophisms, Roll them in the <clears throat> in the rand and carnal understanding, and by their barkings and base answers they break and weary the preachers of Yahuwah's word. So also, for the most part, by using a certain circumlocation, endeavor to avoid uh, publish the chief knowledge concerning the supreme uh, Almighty Shaddai to unworthy ears. Then, uh, beginning from the Father and the Son and the Ruach Hakodesh. He briefly and plainly expound to us, so that all us hearing him wondered that men have forsaken the truth and have turned themselves to vanity. Okay, so what's Peter saying here? Because I think that this is applicable today. <clears throat> so he says, um, nothing is more difficult, uh, you brothers, than to reason concerning the truth in the presence of a mixed multitude of people. So, what would this be like? This would be like if you went to... Imagine if you had a multitude of people, an assembly. Um, let's say that you, as someone who is Torah uh, obedient and that you understand that the, the feasts of Yahuwah are to be kept today, and that we should be, you know, we shouldn't be keeping uh, pagan holidays, and we shouldn't be eating pork, or maybe we shouldn't be eating meat at all, um, and such as that. Let's say, you know, you've got a certain level of understanding, or maybe you understand <clears throat> because of the Zadok testimony from the Dead Sea Scrolls that the calendar is a solar-based calendar and not the uh, lunar-based Sanhedrin calendar. And let's say you're going to an assembly of people where you've got some people that are just you know, mainline Christians, and you know, some of them are willing to change. You know, they just want to know the truth, but then there are others who are you know, not going to let go of their pagan traditions. And then you've got some people there that are messianic, that are so in love with Judah that they won't hear anything that's not in line with what Judah believes. And so, you know, they're, gonna, they're not going to listen to anything about the calendar. And so you're wanting to go in there and you're wanting to take this information and, and you're wanting to share with them the truth of the scriptures from the perspective of the first century believers. <clears throat> and, of course, all these people... You know they're in love with Paul, and they uh, you know follow Paul's teachings, and they don't want to hear anything. They don't know anything about James, and you know so how do you even teach the truth? You know how do you even speak to this multitude of people? You know when I try to talk to somebody about James that doesn't know, like even someone that studies their Bible consistently and knows the Bible inside and out, they don't know who James is, or they might just you know all they know is that he wrote the epistle of James and that he was <clears throat> the brother of Yeshua and that's it. That's all he know. That's all they know. And so you pretty much have to give that person a complete history lesson just to begin to even just to begin 
to begin to broach the subject of, you know, what was what was what are we getting from Paul versus what were the apostles teaching? And even you, like you, the listener, right now, as I've made these videos, there's been some things that I've just been like, you know what, I I don't know if I can really share this on YouTube because I think that even broaching this subject would cause people to stop listening to the video. Uh, you know, one example is I, I've mentioned several times that about the vegetarian diet. Every time I mention that, I think, man, somebody's just going to stop listening. You know, <laughs> I just lost. And, um, and, you know, I mean, it's not that I really care how many people listen so much as if someone's out there seeking truth and it gets to the point that they hear something like that, they just cut the rest of it off. And maybe if they listen to the entire series or if they actually got this PDF and read it, that, you know, they might learn some other things or they might even learn the information that will convince them that the vegetarian diet is the way to go. Ultimately, I don't care. You know, I don't care if you, if you eat only vegetables or meat or whatever. I'm presuming that most of the people listening to this video have probably already given up pork and unclean meat. Um, but whether you, you know, continue eating, you know, beef and chicken and stuff like that or not, you know, that it doesn't really affect me. So, you know, it's not like I'm trying to force you to listen. I'm just teaching you the truth as it's been revealed to me. So, you know, how would you go about that? You know, because some people are wanting to know. Even if you just use the example of going into a Sunday church and trying to teach them about the Sabbath, there are people there who don't want to know the truth. You know, they don't want their routine messed with. They don't want to, to change. You know, and in fact, they, they'll fight you to keep you from telling the truth because they know that they're wrong. But they believe that if they can just stop that word from getting spoken, that it gives them plausible deniability. And so Peter, you know, here he's talking about that. He's saying, look, you know, this is the most difficult thing, is being able to talk to a mixture of people. <clears throat> and I'll tell you the truth. If it's me, me, Brad, talking to somebody, it's very easy for me to take one or two people, you know, like one person, or maybe like two people, like a husband and a wife, and sit down and talk to them and share the truth with them. It's very easy. But, man, you get like eight people, there's always going to be that one person who just wants to argue the entire time. And you might have two or three people that are really wanting to hear the truth, but they'll usually be the ones that are just kind of quietly sitting there. And the person who doesn't want to know the truth is the one that will stand up and argue and debate with you. And it doesn't matter how many times you tell them, like, look, brother, I don't want to argue with you. If you don't want to hear what I have to say, then, then you know, you can either leave the room or, or, or whatever. But, you know, these other people are wanting to hear. And there's no way. Like, they, they just won't stop. And I, I almost think that it's almost like they, they think that if, you, if they allow you to tell the other people in the room, that now, you know, that that they've got to stop that, that they've got to stop that from spreading because they don't want anyone to, to put them on the spot to where they, they have to make a decision. And that's not because of what you're teaching. That's because of the, the Almighty is convicting their spirit and they're not wanting to change. You know, that's, that's what people, you know, you can, you can make just a random statement about something, like on Facebook, and you'll have somebody come in and start arguing with you about it because, and they'll accuse you of judging them. You know, why are you judging people that keep these holidays? Or why are you judging people that eat, you know, this or that? And, you know, that's not you judging them. That's the Spirit convicting them <laughs> that they need to change and they're fighting it for all it's worth. So, uh, now we got a couple of editor's notes. Uh, so for this first one from 2007, it says that the Smith translation has a footnote here uh, concerning these some missing chapters, chapters 2 through 11, um, and that they're saying that, that they have found them utterly untranslatable and have it admit, uh, omitted them. Um, uh, this is not... Uh, I don't know, I mean, this is kind of difficult to really believe that it was untranslatable. More than likely, they didn't want to share the information because, you know, Peter is sitting here talking about 
how do you share information with people that don't want to know the truth and then the very next and then suddenly the next chapters all disappear <laughs> it, it appears that you know if you look here it says you know pearls before swine it appears that that some pearls came before the swine and the swine decided they didn't want to share them uh, but there is another editor's note from 2012 saying that they have discovered these uh, the the missing chapters in what's called the Clementine homilies. <clears throat> so this might bear a little bit of explaining. The 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 Clementine works, as they're called, are two documents. They probably originate from the same document or it's possible that one of the documents is the original um, you know so these two documents one is called the homilies one is called the recognitions the recognitions is the one that we're reading here the one that's called the the um, Nazarene Acts now in Epiphanius in Panarion when he was talking about the Ebionites reading this document that they call the teachings of Peter or the travels of Peter and Epiphanius says that but they've just taken this document and they've they've corrupted it to suit their agenda and, and they've declared Peter to be a vegetarian and all this stuff in their in their uh, so-called travels of Peter uh, my theory is is that the homilies was the the version of the Clementine recognitions that was held by the Roman Church. And so the, the homilies is the Roman Church version of the recognitions. I don't know if that's true. That's just my own personal theory based upon what uh, Epiphanius says. But the author or the, uh, the, the editor of this, the translator Jackson Snyder, he went and found in the homilies, he found this spot where where you know this story le leaves off and there's missing chapters and then you know this where the story continues here later um, you know he, he took that part out of the homilies and, and filled it in now one thing to keep in mind when we start going through these chapters from the, the homilies there's a whole lot of material um, so basically, we're, we're on chapter 1 here, and then here's chapter 12. So there's only 11 chapters missing, but what he fills it in with in the appendix is a lot more than 11 chapters. So we don't know what's missing. You know, he just he put it all in there. It's a lot more than what is missing, if that makes sense. So we have to go to, in my document here, it is page 245, uh, one of the appendixes. If you downloaded the PDF from jacksonsnyder.com, I think that PDF is a little bit different. But if you type in 245, that should get you um, close to the appendix. So here's the appendix. <clears throat> it said the lost chapters recovered from the Clementine homilies. Um, so as you can see, there's a whole lot more than just 11 chapters. This is like I don't know, a hundred chapters that they, they inserted in there. Um, so we're going to move now to the Clementine homilies, and we're going to do we're going to do this part, and then once we get through the study on the homilies, then we're going to skip back to the recognitions and pick up in chapter twelve. <clears throat> and there is some overlap between uh, these two works. So it says, some of our people attend uh, feignly upon Simon and his companions as if they were persuaded by his most atheistic error in order that they may learn his purpose and disclose it to us so that we may be able to confront this terrible man on favorable terms. And now I have learned from them what arguments he is going to employ in the discussion. And knowing this, I give thanks to Elohim on the one hand, and I congratulate you on the other on the postponement of the discussion, for since I instructed you uh, before the discussion, you know the arguments that he will use and can learn without danger of failing. So this uh, appears to be back from before the debate 
with Peter and Simon Magus even began. It says, For the scriptures have joined them to many falsehoods against Elohim on this account. The prophet Moses, by the order of Elohim, delivered the Torah with the explanations to seventy chosen men, in order that they might also instruct such of the people as they chose. And uh, after some time, the written Torah had added to it certain falsehoods contrary to the Torah of Elohim, who made the heavens and the earth and all the things that are in them, this evil one having dared to work this for his evil purpose. This took place in reason and judgment that those might be convicted who should dare to listen to the things written against Elohim, and to those who, through love toward Elohim, should not only disbelieve the things spoken against him, but should not even endure their, to hear them at all. Even if they should happen to be true, judging it much safer to incur danger with respect to religious faith than to live with an evil conscience on account of blasphemous words. So this is reflecting in a, uh, a belief that was shared by all the the Nazarene Ebionite Essene groups is that the the um, scribes had essentially added to the Torah of Moses. Now this also reflects in here that that Moses had given the Torah to the seventy chosen men um, with explanations for for what everything meant. Um, now, I think this may be what the Jewish people claim as the beginning of the oral Torah. Um, I can't say for sure if that's it, but I don't, I don't think that the oral Torah has anything to do with Moses. Um, I think you could look at it just as like a Bible commentary. Now, I'm not saying everything in the, in the Talmud is evil either. Um, you know, something you have to use discernment for. You can um, gain some nuggets out of it you know there are it, but it's basically like a bible commentary i mean you could read a christian bible commentary and get good information you know but you don't have to treat it as a religious belief that you believe in the talmud um <clears throat> now peter actually refers to this in his letter that we we read at um back in part six Part 6b, when I was talking about the stoning of Stephen, and we went to Peter's letter, which is also included in this PDF that you have um, in one of the other appendixes, that Moses had given 70 men. This would have been the, um, the 70 elders that he um, consecrated at the suggestion of uh, Jethro. And that through these 70 men, the entire camp was taught the Torah. <clears throat> Simon, therefore, as I learned, intend, as I learned, intends to come into public and to speak of those chapters against Elohim that are added to the scriptures for the sake of temptation, that he may seduce as many wretched ones as he can from the love of Elohim. For we do not wish to say in public that these chapters are added to the scriptures, since we should thereby perplex the unle unlearned multitude, so as and so accomplish the purpose of this evil Simon, for they do not even, for they do not yet have the power to discern, and would flee from us as if we were evil, or as if not only the blasphemous chapters were false, they would even withdraw from the word. Wherefore, we are under a necessity of assenting to the false chapters and putting questions in a return to him concerning them, to draw him into a strait and to give in private an explanation of the chapters that are spoken against Elohim uh, to the well-disposed after a trial of their faith, and of this there is but one way, and that a brief one, it is this. Okay, so, and so, you know, isn't this true, basically? I mean, if you're, um, I'm sure that even many of you, when I said that there was a belief among the Nazarenes that there was additions to the Torah, I'm sure many of you probably balked at that. It was like, oh no, you can't say that. You can't. Well, you know, what is what is Peter talking about? He's talking about the chapters or the verses in the scripture that seem to indicate that Yahuwah is less than perfect. So, for instance, um, <clears throat> I think one of the, the uh, if memory serves me correctly, like one of the examples he uses is when the scriptures say that Yahuwah is um, you know creates evil 
So, you know, how can you say that Yahuwah creates evil? That would make Yahuwah himself evil. Or another place where it says Yahuwah is jealous, you know, because jealous is generally thought of as a weak human emotion. So why would Yahuwah be jealous? It's things like that. Like, this is the thing that, that uh, Peter is saying was the alterations in the scripture. And so, you know, when it's like this example that Peter talks about, you know, how can you share information, truth, with a multitude of people? Because as soon as you say that some of the, the chapters, some of the verses in Scripture are in question, then the unlearned people, you know, the people who don't know this, who, who are not really up to speed on Scripture, will, will draw away, will leave, because they'll think that, that you're teaching falsehood. Or they'll think that, um, or, or maybe they'll turn away from the scripture altogether. I'll use a, I'll use a modern example, actually. Um, a while back, now this is back when I thought that Paul was a, a true apostle. You know, this is back when I believed in Paul. And I was having a conversation with a Christian. And this Christian pointed out Paul's statement that he makes several times, but he, he says that the righteous shall live by faith. And many, a couple of years ago I was reading and I came to that, the righteous shall live by faith, and I'm sitting there and I'm really kind of meditating on that verse and thinking, you know, what, what does Paul mean here? And I had this thought pop into my mind, and now... I believe it was it was Yahuwah speaking to me. But the thought comes into my mind that the righteous shall live by his faith. And then it was like, and as soon as I thought that, this whole uh, like vision opened up in my mind, or you know, this sudden understanding. Um, and I understood what was meant by that. It means that the righteous shall live by his faith. So, the way you live your life reflects your faith. So, you know, we'll use an example from, from another religion. You know, I'm, I'm sure if you're ever on social media, you see all these pictures of, of like Muslims praying in the middle of the street in New York City, and so, you know, it stops traffic and everything, and there's this real uh, kind of a obnoxious thing where um, when it's time to pray, these Muslims will, will just, you know, kneel down, and start praying in the middle of the street, and disrupting traffic, disrupting everyone else. That's an example of them living by their faith. So, you know, if the righteous will live by their faith, here you see the Muslims living by their faith. You know, if you're a pagan, you can see the pagan living by his faith when they give, um, you know, thanks to you know, the moon god or the sun god or whatever when they, you know, eat or, or get up or whatever. And then, you know, so you see the Jewish people, they live by their faith when they say the Shimon Ezra or when, you know, when they pray three times a day, they're living by their faith. And as believers in Yeshua, you should live by your faith. And what is your faith? Well, your faith should be following the commands of, of the Father in the way that Yeshua instructed us to. You know, you living by your faith should be you walking in the faith of Abraham, which includes following the commandments of Elohim. So I'm sharing that with this man. This, this man was a Christian. And I said, no, what Paul means is the righteous shall live by faith, by his faith. So when you live by your faith, then you're being righteous. You know, so, and I, I tried to explain that. And he laughed at me and him and a couple other people started ridiculing me there on that Facebook thread that you know I was twisting the scriptures and I was adding to the scriptures and they kept telling me you know you're you're uh, you know condemning me for adding to scripture let's just leave it at that and so you know I finally got frustrated and I just you know left the 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 thread quit commenting but here's the thing years later Two years later, I find out where Paul was getting that from. The righteous shall live by faith. If you'll turn to Habakkuk 
Habakkuk 2.4 is the scripture that Paul was quoting. Except it does not say the righteous shall live by faith. It says the righteous shall live by his faithfulness. The righteous, the righteous shall live by his faithfulness. Exact opposite meaning of what Paul, or Paul not translates, but as Paul um, um, demonstrates that scripture. Like the way that, that Paul interprets that scripture is the exact opposite of the plain meaning of the text. The plain meaning of the text is not that the righteous are going to live just by believing. It is that the righteous are going to live by practicing their faith and by, by being faithful to the Elohim of Israel. So now those people that were accusing me of adding to Scripture, that wasn't true. Who was the person that added to, that, that changed Scripture? Paul. That's an example of Paul taking Scripture from the prophets turning it on its face, using it for the exact opposite purpose it was intended, and he added to slash took away from Scripture. And they were accusing me of doing that because I was trying to change it back. You know, Paul took a verse, adulterated it, twisted it, used it for his own, his own purpose, a destructive heresy, and I was trying to take the same verse, put it back in the correct context, and use it correctly, and I was the one that was accused of twisting the scripture. So there's two lessons to be learned. If Paul was a true apostle, would he need to take scripture and twist it, and change it, and adulterate it? No. No, if he was a true prophet, if he were a true apostle, he could take the scripture as it's written and, and teach it properly. And so how do we know that he didn't do that? How do we know that maybe Habakkuk was changed? Well, we know Habakkuk wasn't changed because in the Dead Sea Scrolls, we have the Habakkuk Pesher, which actually has Habakkuk 2.4 written the same way as it's written in your Bible today. The righteous shall live by his faithfulness. The Habakkuk Pesher was written by the Ebionites. It was written by the followers of James. So we know how they interpreted that scripture. Paul interpreted that scripture in the exact opposite way. Further evidence, he's a false apostle. Now, so here's the example. In the same way that I could not teach Paul, the, not Paul, but I couldn't teach the scripture Paul was using properly because Paul had twisted it, Peter's saying the same thing. Because they have been, the scriptures have been falsified, now if you try to teach somebody the true interpretation of it, they're going to call you a heretic. When in reality, all you're trying to do is correct what was done by someone else. Um, so, we go on to chapter... Uh, what is that? 40, chapter 40. Everything that is spoken or written against Elohim is false. But that we say is this truly, not only for the sake of reputation, but for the sake of truth, I will convince you when my discourse has proceeded a little further. You, my most beloved Clement, ought not to be sorry at Shimon's having interposed a day between this and the discussion at hand. For today... Uh, before the discussion, you will be instructed concerning the chapters added to Scripture, and then in the discussion concerning the only one in good Elohim, the maker of the, also of the world. You ought not to be distracted, but in the discussion you will even wonder how unrighteous men, overlooking, overlooking the multitudes of things that are spoken in the Scriptures for Elohim and looking at those that are spoken against him, gladly bring these forward. And thus the hearers, by reason of ignorance, believing the things against Elohim, become the outcasts from his kingdom. Wherefore you, by the advantage of the postponement, uh, learning the mystery of the scriptures, are gaining the means of not sinning against Elohim, 
will be in compare will incomparably rejoice. So this is kind of playing on what I just finished saying. Is is the same thing? Like uh, you know, you can't you can't bring these forward. You know, you you can't. Um, You can't be honest with what the scriptures say. And basically, it's what I'm trying to say. You know, you if you if you know the truth, sometimes it's hard to teach people the truth because they cling to their faulty understanding. Or in this case, you know, this this faulty writing. You know, in my case, it was a faulty writing by Paul. And in Peter's case, he's been taught by the Messiah that there were some things that were adulterated in the scriptures, and the Messiah told Peter the correct interpretation, and then. Um, but you know now you know Peter's like. But if you share that with people, a lot of people will reject it, and they'll blame you. When in reality, all you're doing is trying to help them. <clears throat> it says, "Then I, Clement, hearing this, said, Truly, I rejoice and give thanks to Elohim, who in all things does well. However, he knows that I will be able to think nothing uh, other than that all things are for Elohim. Do not suppose that I ask questions as doubting the words concerning Elohim." or those that are to be spoken, but rather that I may learn, and so be able myself to instruct another who is unaccustomed to learning. So tell me the falsehoods added to the scriptures, and how it is that they are really false. Then Keith answered, Even although you had not asked me, I would have gone on in order and afforded you the exposition of these matters, as I promised. Learn then how the scriptures misrepresent him in many respects, so that you may know when you happen upon them. So he's, you know, so this should be important. You know, Peter is essentially saying, "Look, I'm not going to tell you every chat. I'm going to tell you how to recognize it, so that way you you can know." And I think that's important for us because if they, I think the same could be said about the the Gospels um, or the New Testament. You know, at the time that Peter's speaking this, the New Testament either hasn't been written or at least has not come to its final form. So. Um, we can use we should be able to use these same methods for determining if someone's writing a falsehood about Peter or 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 Yeshua or the apostles or or any of the um, the followers. You know, I mean, if if Yeshua went around and personally picked out these apostles to be his emissaries, and then someone's talking against the emissaries, then you know that in itself is the same as as speaking against Yeshua. Um, you know, if somebody's coming along after the fact and claiming that they were also chosen to be an emissary after the death of Yeshua, but their testimony doesn't line up with the other apostles, then that in itself is also a good example as to how you could tell a falsehood. <clears throat> what am I going to tell you will be sufficient by way of an example. But I do not think, my dear Clement, that anyone who possesses ever so little love to Elohim and unaccustomed to learning will be able to take in or even to hear the things that are spoken against him. For how is it that he can have an overarching soul and yet be set apart? Supposing that there are many Elohim and not one only. But even if there be but one who will cherish zeal to be set apart, one finds, him, finds in him so many defects since he will hope that at that the beginning of all things, by reason of the defects of his own nature, um, will not visit the crimes of others. So let's go back and reread this. I think I butchered a little bit. For how is it that he can have an overarching soul and yet be set apart, supposing that there are many Elohim and not one only? But even if there be but one, who will cherish zeal to be set apart, one finds in him many defects, since he will hope that the beginning of all things, by reason of the defects of his own nature, will not visit the crimes of others. So, will not visit the crimes of others. So he will hope that the beginning of, the, of all things will not visit the crimes of others. I'm trying to figure out where, you know, there's a, a clause that's put in here that I think is breaking the sentence up to where it's hard to um, to really for me to figure out the exact meaning of this sentence. But if there be but one who will cherish zeal to be set apart by reason of the defects of his own nature will not visit the crimes of others. I guess that's the way it's meant. 
So basically, I think what I was saying is that if you find many de defects in Yahuwah, how is he really justified in being able to visit the defects of others? I think that's the meaning of the sentence. Although I'm having trouble really constructing it in a way that it, it makes sense and it's easy to read. Uh, Wherefore, far be it from us to believe that the Master of all, who made the heaven and the earth and all things that are in them, shares his government with others, or that he lies. For if he lies, then who speaks the truth? Or if he makes experiments as in ignorance, who then foreknows? If he deliber deliberates and changes his purpose, who then is perfect in understanding and permanent? If he, if he envies, who is above rivalry? If he hardens hearts, who makes wise? If he makes blind and deaf, who has given sight and hearing? If he commits pilfering, who administers justice? If he mocks, who is sincere? If he is weak, who is omnipotent? If he is unjust, who is just? And if he makes evils, who will make good things? If he does evil, who will do good? So, you know, these are some good questions. Like if, uh, and I think it, maybe as I read through some of these, you, you recognize, that, oh yeah, I've, you know, I've never really thought about that. Um, you know, if he is, if he is weak, who is omnipotent? If he is unjust, who is just? If he makes evil things, who will make good things? So, these are good questions. You know, how, how can we justify scriptures that even uh, allude to you who are being imperfect? Like if he deliberates and changes his purpose, you know, that, that's what's said in the, in the section of the Torah about Moses, or not Moses, Noah. He changed his mind, and he repented that he had made men. Well, if he, if he repents that he made men, then how is he omnipotent? <clears throat> But if he desires the fruitful hill, who then are in, who then are in all things? If he is false, then who is true? If he lives in a tent, who is without bounds? If he is fond of fat, sacrifices offerings and drink offerings, who then is without need? And who is holy and pure and perfect? If he is pleased with lamps and wicks, who then places the luminaries in the sky? If he dwells in shadow and darkness and storm and smoke, who is the light that lightens the universe? If he comes with trumpets, shouting, and darts and arrows, who is the sought-after tran tranquility of all? If he loves war, then who wishes peace? If he makes evil things, who makes good things? If he is without affection, who is a lover of men? If he is not faithful to his promises, who will be trusted? If he loves the evil adulterers and murderers, who will be a just judge? If he changes his mind, who is steadfast? And if he chooses evil men, who then takes part of the good? Wherefore, O Clement, my son, be aware of these things, otherwise of Elohim. Wherefore, O Clement, my son, be aware of thinking otherwise of Elohim, that than that he is the only Elohim, master and father, good and righteous, the creator, long-suffering, merciful, the sustainer, the benefactor, ordaining love of men, counseling purity, immortal, and making immortal, incapable of dwelling in the souls of the good, who cannot be contained, and yet is contained within the heart who has fixed the great world as a center in space, who has spread out the skies and solidified the land, who has stored up the water, who has disposed the stars in the sky, who has made the fountains flow in the earth, has produced faults, raised up mountains, has set bounds to the sea, has ordered winds and blasts, who by the spirit of counsel has kept safety, who has kept safely the body comprehended in a boundless sea. So, you know, all of these are are things to think about, you know, can we really, um, can we really hold two contrary opinions? You know, is he perfect and boundless, or is he boundful and imperfect? This is our judge to whom it behooves us to look and to regulate our own souls, thinking all things in his favor, speaking well of him, persuaded that by his long suffering he brings light to the obstinate, obstinacy obstinacity of all and is alone good and he at the end of all will sit as a just judge upon every one of those who have attempted what they ought not when I Clement heard this I said truly this is Shabbat guarding piety and again I said I would like to learn what the scripture has why the scripture has any writings of this sort for I remember that you said that it was for the conviction of those who would dare to believe anything that was 
spoken against Elohim, but since you permit us, we venture to ask at your command if anyone, most beloved Kepha, should choose to say to us the scriptures are true, though to you the things spoken against Elohim seem to be false. How should we answer him? Okay, we're at 40 minutes right now. I think it's a good time to stop here for a moment, and I will return, and we can get into following chapters. Shalom.